Very good afternoon, everyone, and very warm welcome to my talk here. My name is uh, Xiao Yong, and I'm the head of the Triple program at the University of Southampton, Malaysia. And today I'll just I'll be giving you a talk on to the introduction to the electrical electronic engineering program that we offer here. Now, just a bit of um, housekeeping. Uh, uh, if you have any question during my talk, uh, you can actually click on the Q&A button that's located on the bottom of the screen if you are coming in from Zoom. Uh, if you're coming in from Facebook Live, uh, you can actually message the question over. And uh, we have a set of panelists in the background ready to take on your question. Alternatively, we do have uh, uh, allocated time for your questions to be asked towards the end of the talk. Okay. Now, uh, before I get started uh, on the nitty gritty of the AAA program, I would actually like to pose this particular question to everyone here. Now, what exactly is the difference between university education and a high school education or for that matter, secondary school education? What, that, what exactly is the difference between them? I mean, you both study in both places. In high school, you get a certificate, university get a degree, is that it? Or maybe it is all about this particular instant where in a primary school, you're a bit more attentive because this is the first point. You get into a school, you're excited, new friends, and you can see like you will be showing full attendance. I can, I can vouch that for myself. I see my daughter very excited uh, about her school. And of course, once you progress to high school, maybe things are a bit different. Um, uh, boredom sets in and perhaps uh, not so attentive anymore. Then what about university then? <laughs> no, that's not the case. All right. Now, the, 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 the difference between university and high school can best be explained by this uh, analogy, the analogy of a football player. Now, over at high school, down to primary school, the teachers will be prepping up the football player on, how, on the aspects of how to kick the ball. How can students um, impart the best kick onto the ball such that the ball can travel at the desired speed? And the teachers even tell the football player where to kick the ball to. So what's in it for university then, since all the know-how is kind of uh, taken care of? Well, over at university, we, the facilitator of the higher education, tell the football player why they need to kick in that direction. So if you think about it, it's the emphasis here is no longer in the mechanical detailed step leading to a solution, but the emphasis is more on understanding the problem at hand and consequently providing a solution to it. And that's what we want to see all our graduates get at the end of the day. And at Southampton, we are good in that. And the facts and figures that I'm sh sharing here uh, say it all. Now, the most interesting thing about this slide is this particular bit where 94% of all the Southampton graduates entered employment within six months of leaving university. And mind you, this is across the board. So if you just look at engineering, particularly in triple E, it's close to 100% for that matter. It is very sought after. And another thing to note is that the university is actually a founding member of the Russell Group. And what does that mean? Now, the Russell Group is actually a group of very research intensive university. What do you mean by research intensive? It simply means in layman's term that these universities are constantly solving real world problems. And that has got very, very uh, direct implications on our graduates, making our graduates so ready when they, when upon graduation, they are ready to enter the workforce because whatever projects that they're doing, whatever modules that they're taking, they're relevant to the real world. Now, uh, I always like to say this to our students, uh, engineers always view that our equations approximate the real world. And 
it is uh, very much that uh, we are doing over at Southampton here. And for Triple E, the ranking, uh, according to the Times Good University Guide, is number three. And we're just um, uh, under Imperial College and Cambridge University. Okay, so it goes to show uh, that, uh, that the, the quality of the Triple E program over at Southampton is really of a world class standard. Okay, next is this um, the question on why Triple E? I mean, I can seriously go on and on about why you need to do triple E. I mean, just look around you. Look at the things that you're surrounded with, all the applications that you're using, all the consumer electronics that you're using to, to just carry on your daily lives. For instance, now the, the, the conversations we have, how do I host this webinar? How do I host this particular talk without triple E engineering? All of this would be impossible. So I guess that instead of me looking into why Triple E, uh, I would like to share something with you here. Let's look at the demand for Triple E. I guess if we know the demand for Triple E, that says it all as to why Triple E is very, very important here. Okay, now how do we check out the demand for it? A uh, couple of months ago, I did this quick uh, check on Job Street Malaysia. Just looking at the uh, specific engineering jobs uh, in Job Street Malaysia, and I click under the specialization section, and I get a list of engineering jobs uh, that are available at the time. And from the list, I can see like electrical electronics total up to 970. And if I compare this triple E with the rest, I can clearly see that triple E is in hot demand, all right? Oil and gas once upon a time used to be very popular, but it has actually dropped uh, in recent time. Okay, now I got interested in this and I've decided to check out what's happening across the causeway, Singapore. And the same trend is observed. Triple E is still the number one in demand engineering jobs over in Job Street, Singapore. And then I got interested further. I just want to see, well, what about in the UK then? So I went on to Read UK. Now Read UK is the equivalent of Job Street, Malaysia, Singapore, the number one job seeker site. And the same trend is observed. Triple E is in huge demand. And, and that can actually be uh, contributed by Brexit as well, because uh, quite a lot of uh, Europeans are actually moving out of uh, UK that uh, presents a good opportunity for triple engineers in the country to actually get the job. And that's why you can see that the number count is a lot greater. Uh, we have to bear in mind that the population in the UK is uh, twice the size of Malaysia as well. Okay, and, and, then I've this, and then I decided to make a comparison because I actually did a similar survey uh, three years ago, uh, probably less than three years ago because that was August 2017, and I got the same trend. And now when I plot everything together for a nice comparison, I can see that the demand for triple E is consistent, uh, at least for that two sample years where I did this check, you can see like both in 2017, 2020, three years before and now, Triple E is still in very uh, high demand. And that's followed closely by the other program which we offer here, which is mechanical engineering. And the rest of the engineering fields are a bit um, lower compared to that. So I guess that that uh, gives us a very nice uh, trend which says that, which is consistent to what we observe because of our own human demand. We demand a lot of triple E related applications. And it is, it is no wonder why uh, we need so many engineers to support this kind of demand. Okay, I would like to share with you some of the triple E milestones at Southampton. Uh, so that we can build up a bit of historical fact and how this triple E came about. Now, if you didn't know, Southampton is the, actually the first UK university to offer the electronics degree. So when we think about that, 
uh, we can relate that to the first place in the region to actually attract the most talented triple E engineers and academics to actually sit down together, come together and contribute to the area. Which means that the foundation that Southampton Triple E has is, is, is really the best because it's the first to actually have this uh, program available. And of course, in the 70s, we can see the university is the only Ukrainian university that's able to design and make electronic circuits. And this is, again, we, we can see the direct relationship because they're the first and they are the first to be able to develop the facility and hence they are able to conquer this area well before the others. And the progress does not stop there. In the 80s, uh, Professor Sir David Payne, who is shown here, is still a faculty member of the uh, School of Electronics and Computer Science, which a uh, AAA program is under, invented the Erbium Dope Fiber Amplifier. Now that's quite a mouthful technical term. What is that EDFA? That is actually an amplifier which can amplify light. What's the implication? Without EDFA, we won't have Unify, put it simply. It's able to roll out those uh, fiber optic cables over long distances, thanks to this invention. And Professor Sir David Payne is very much a faculty member and you will definitely see him around on campus uh, when you progress to Southampton in the final two years of your studies. Okay, and we also have uh, people uh, like Professor Sir Tim Berners-Lee and if you don't know the name, uh, I'm sure that you would have used his creation. He was the creator for the World Wide Web and he so, so affiliated faculty member of the ECS. That's the kind of uh, pioneers we have in the faculty. And that actually gives our students a lot of inspiration because you can, you can see like you are in the same institution where all these pioneering figures are. And just a decade ago, just 10 years ago, uh, we, uh, the Southampton University founded the ARM ECS Research Center. Now this ARM is a global player in designing a semiconductor chip. And to put it simply, uh, if you haven't heard of ARM, I'll just say that more than 95% of worldwide smartphones would have ARM processors sitting on it, namely the iPhones. They use a lot of ARM set of uh, processor. They are very famous for their reduced instruction set architecture uh, in a way that they can actually have very low uh, power consumption chip uh, that's very uh, suitable for mobile applications, the one that you can, the one that need to rely on battery only. Okay, and of course, uh, seven years ago, we have another major, major milestone because uh, we offer the opportunity for Malaysian students and from the region around ASEAN and the wider Asian region to actually come and do this program with us. Uh, in the form of two plus two. And we, in the first batch, we've got 10 students, which I will show some pictures of their graduation uh, later. Uh, and in 2015, all of them uh, uh, managed to transfer the cross to the Southampton Highfield campus successfully. Okay. Next, I would like to point out about uh, some of the research excellence uh, that the Triple E uh, program offers. Uh, the Triple E program is quite a broad based program. And out of that broad based program, you can actually, dis you can actually choose to delve into the many, many different research uh, areas that we actually have uh, in the form of uh, different projects. Uh, in, you, you will get to do more of that in the third year and fourth year of your study where in the form of this uh, individual project and group project. But I would like to point out something here. If you look at the first uh, left side corner, uh, that is just uh, a snapshot of part of the state of the art uh, interdisciplinary clean room that we have over at the Southampton campus. Uh, all up, uh, Southampton has actually committed in excess of 120 million pounds to, to the facility. And 
the Rome wasn't built in a day, so was all these uh, facilities. Like I say, because of the, the, the history that Southampton has, the, the build up, you know, just continue on, the progress continues, and up until now, you know, the university has actually contributed so much. And some of the instruments in this uh, uh, particular facility is actually so sensitive. They, for instance, I'll just quote this uh, helium ion microscope that can go down to resolution of around 0.9 nanometer. Now, if you can't imagine how small it is, is this uh, 0.9 nanometer, I can actually draw a comparison to the size of the COVID-19 virus. Now, what's the size of that COVID-19 virus? That's around 80 to 90 nanometer. So here we're talking about this helium ion microscope that can actually go down to resolution, which is 100 times smaller the size of that virus, which we can't see anyway. And all these are actually providing further resolution to some of the facilities like the uh, focused ion beam facility to actually do all this nano structuring on the different kind of materials, uh, mainly semiconductor or dielectric materials. And we also have uh, a lot of uh, uh, research that's associated with artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning. And one good example is this picture down here, which is the 3D biometric tunnel. Now, what this particular tunnel does is that it actually remembers how a person walk. Put it simply, it actually extracts certain features from a distinct person, and apparently there is the equivalent of fingerprint to how an individual uh, walks. And if you just um, have those features available, what it means is that you can actually use the CCTV to actually identify a particular person from the way that an individual uh, walk around. Okay, next I will actually move on to Tony Davies High Voltage Laboratory. Uh, for that, uh, I would like to invite my colleague here, uh, that's uh, Dr. Lin Chi Sen, who specializes in power engineering, to talk a bit more about the power engineering related research at the University of Southampton. Hi. Um... So on power engineering, basically we can see it as having two components here, yeah? two, two categories. One is on the classical power systems, the other one is on the modern power engineering. Well, this Tony, Tony Davis High Laboratory focuses on the classical side, which is so critical to today's power infrastructures. So you can imagine that we, so when we talk about power engineering, we have power plants and we have the transmission line that carries the energy from the power plant to, to us, yeah, to nearby our housing areas. And that transmission line technology is being supported by a wide range of uh, component technologies that require a lot of research. And this research, this Tony Davis high, high voltage laboratory can actually uh, 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 support this kind of research and it has proven track record for the past 10 to 20 years on pioneering a lot of new technologies yeah so on the thing that they can do in this lab is uh, we are talking about hundreds of kilo uh, testing so the transmission line that we have nowadays most uh, most of them are running at tens or hundreds of kilo volt, and we have to make sure that the insulation of the conductor uh, is durable and also is uh, robust to um, um, partial breakdowns and to in order to characterize all that of the material then you need a very sophisticated um, lab and this is uh, what the, this laboratory can provide and in fact uh, they are one of the best uh, high voltage lab in UK so this is the the, the, the focus of this uh, laboratory. And uh, yeah, so hello, do you have one, do I add anything on that? Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, that goes to show the breadth of the research areas uh, going as small as nanometer range up to high kilo volt uh, uh, power electronics. All right, and of course we have all the in-between, uh, the other uh, uh, 
thing I would like to point out is the Southampton is also pioneering research in printed smart textiles. And when you see this kind of a material embedded electronics design, I'm sure that you can relate that to the, uh, the phones that you can actually bend around and all that you know, has to do with this research area, uh, which goes to show how relevant uh, the research excellence uh, is uh, over at Southampton. Okay. Um, next, I would also like to point out about the teaching and learning facilities that the university has. We know that the university actually uh, commit a lot of uh, money in terms of driving research excellence, uh, but the university is also spending huge amount to make sure that all of that research excellence can actually be taught in nice set of uh, teaching and learning modules, uh, laboratories, so that we can train the next generation of engineers. Uh, and just very recently, late 2018, so that's barely two years again, uh, the university has just revamped the whole uh, triple E lab, especially for the uh, third year and fourth year students. Uh, and how do they actually revamp all these things? Uh, they get it from the various feedback from various stakeholders, uh, different industry players, uh, different uh, alumni, diff and even our current students. Uh, many, many of those stakeholders, they come back and we analyze, we look at the feedback and we try and incorporate everything in into providing the best uh, teaching and learning facility to actually help uh, students become the engineers that they aspire to be. Uh, so all you can say is that the University of Southampton, especially the AAA program, actually facilitates uh, the process for you to be the engineer that you want. And the world is an oyster next. Okay, now I'm going to uh, talk more about the nature of the AAA program, uh, like what you expect to, to have. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it's it will be a two plus two program. All up, it will take four years of your time to complete this Master of Engineering in Triple E. Okay, now in the first two years when you're in Malaysia, uh, we actually focus more on the sound uh, preparation for the final part of the degree, which means that we will be concentrating on the fundamentals of electrical and electronics engineering. And as you progress through the course, you will see that there will be more design exercises coming your way. Uh, that's a natural thing. We need to make sure that you've just got the foundation right for you to be able to progress onto the next uh, level. Um, and talking about the transition, uh, I'm just going to uh, share a bit of experience that some of the students have, and of course the feedback that we got from parents, uh, what they find you know, with these uh, two years in Malaysia versus uh, straight to the to the UK or overseas is that they find that um, students are having easier time to actually transition. Now mind you when students enter university when they come first year uh, they could be coming from other parts of Malaysia uh, such as KL or East Malaysia where they are still away from home and all these students are actually just in their high teens. They are, they are still very much teenagers category, uh, which means that they've got to worry about, you know, what to eat and who's going to do their laundry, etc. And on top of that, you, you are transitioning from high school to university where everything is going to be more on the wise bit, uh, which is, which is, uh, can be challenging for some. So all of a sudden they have to cope with so many things. So luckily with this program, uh, the transition is a bit less in a way that uh, the community is uh, well supported and we're still in Malaysia, the same region, as opposed to going straight to the UK where the environment and the, the weather and everything you know, needs that steep transition point. So we find that very helpful in that two years to develop that independence here in Malaysia. And after that two years, they are so ready to progress to the UK to, to complete the third and fourth part of their studies. Uh, we, we have, uh, of course, support in place to, to do all that, but we can see them growing up more as a more independent uh, student, you know, at the end of these uh, two years. That's what I observed uh, over the years. And of course, uh, 
uh, we are stressing quite a lot of fundamentals and I'm going to share with you uh, some of the modules that uh, students are actually taking. Now you don't have to worry about detail, but I would just like to uh, point out that the kind of uh, areas that you are looking at is down from programming to circuits level, and then we go up to, to uh, communications and power electronics. It really covers the whole ground. And importantly, all of these are very much underpinned by uh, maths and physics. Okay, and another thing about the Southampton program, AAA program, is that we also emphasize very heavily on the experimental uh, techniques and design tools and construction uh, skills. And we, des we, we try and embed all these um, outcomes into uh, separate labs. We call it the skills labs. Now all these uh, skill labs, they are not part of any module. They sit independently. So every student, every triple E student would have need to, would need to complete this set of skills labs. Why is that so? Because we find that all these skill labs are a necessary thing to actually expose all triple E students to, 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 to the most basic things such as how to use an oscilloscope and, 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 and what we believe is that the more you actually use those instruments, the more capable you are. Uh, it's a bit like you know, we, 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 we look at the theory, but we also need to balance that with the practical side of things because we understand that certain things in triple E can't be actually expressed by just reading it. It's a bit like you can't read a manual to drive a car. You actually need to sit in the car and drive it. Then you get the, the, uh, the skill set to actually do that. And some of the feedback that I commonly hear uh, here, in Malaysia, here in Malaysia is that um, a lot of the AAA graduates nowadays, they are actually uh, fairly weak on the technical aspects of things. Uh, they are being um, guided by technicians. Uh, so we make sure that uh, the, the, at the end of the day, our students are very balanced across, you know, through all these um, skills labs, technical labs, and of course the various design exercises uh, we have. Just to give you an example, when students join us, they will, in the first year of the study, they have to actually construct this particular board. Now this is, uh, this is a fully constructed board. You know, students will receive all these discrete components and an empty one. So first thing, they need to assemble everything and construct the whole thing. And this board is actually designed in-house, which means that it's actually designed uh, by Triple E Southampton. And they would have to design, they would have to construct, test, and learn to actually write a range of interactive programs to how to connect this microcontroller to the interface that they're using. How do, you, how do you talk to the microcontroller to actually perform the things that you want it to perform? So of course, as they progress in their years, this kind of design will be one notch, one notch higher. And the more that you progress, the, 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 the more complicated the design process gets. But overall, they are continuously experiencing the same fundamental design. All right? It's just that the level is different. So that's the kind of thing that we want all our students to have at the end of their study. All right, and all in first year. And I would like to urge everyone here to check out the persistence of vision experiment, which we have actually got a video on uh, that's actually done by a student on how they actually use this Ilmato board to actually carry out this persistence of vision experiment. We have the link available on the demonstration site on the southanthermalaysia.com open day uh, website. So please do uh, have a look, check it out. Okay, now towards the uh, last two years uh, where students will be progressing to the UK, uh, we call it uh, those two years to be the specialist options year. Now don't uh, misunderstand the term specialist options. Uh, well, they are specialist options because you will be choosing individual project and group design project 
that's related to a particular research areas. And that's why it specializes. For instance, for individual project, if you choose a power engineering related, so you'll be looking at power science. But that doesn't mean that you can't go to electronics. That doesn't mean you can't go into cybersecurity, no. Because the fundamentals are there. It's just that it so happened that your project is looking at a, 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 a section of the triple E uh, sub areas. Uh, this is where students pick up a lot of uh, skill set and uh, and I'll just share with you some of the projects that our students can actually choose from uh, from the different areas uh, across the Triple E program. And how do we get all these uh, different areas about is because we have at more than 13 research groups in, 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 the, in the School of Electronics and Computer Science. And what happens there is that each group is actually tackling a very relevant real world problems, right? They are, we are research active. That's what we're trying, we're solving world's problem, a uh, problem that matters to people. So from those uh, problems, we are able to create projects that we can actually get our students in to participate. So that's how. And that's why when students actually choose a project related to the many, many areas, they're able to get a sample of the real world problem that they are doing. They, they, they will really feel like they are, whilst doing that project, they are working as an engineer, right? That's, that's part of the, the, the training, the learning and teaching, you know, that we have actually embedded in, the, in this uh, program itself. Uh, quite a lot of students are very interested in artificial intelligence and that boils down to machine learning. But when it comes to artificial intelligence in triple E, we are not a user of AI, okay? So we don't just go Google and download an AI and key in the parameters and just increase the database so that we get better training every time. No, it's not about that. We actually look down at, as to how to better design all these AI algorithms. Now, before AI was so popular, uh, it was actually called neural networks and they are interrelated. It's just that now we package everything under this broad name of AI that people can relate to. But at the end of the day, like for instance, some of the projects, our students would then have to identify critical features or design new features. So what are those features? They are like signature, just like this gate analysis features that you can identify to be unique to this particular set of data that's common. So that's what we have. And of course, uh, we do have uh, nanotechnology related photonics and my area would fall into this broad category of vision learning and control. My uh, research interest is in uh, assistive listening device, hearing aids, how to actually make, how to actually enhance speech in noisy environments. How do you make sure that people with hearing uh, impairment can communicate just like us in a cafe setting in a noisy environment? And can they not crank up the TV volume when they're sitting in a living room? Things like that. So they are very real world because those, we, we exist, engineers exist because there are so many problems that we have yet to solve. If one day all the problems <laughs> engineering problems are solved, then we'll be really out of job, all right? So, so the, the, the list can go on and on, and I would actually urge you to actually just check out our website and just uh, Google each of these area and get to know them, all right? Get yourself interested, you know? We only live for X number of years, so make ourselves productive, okay? Now I'm going to share with you a very success story uh, that was uh, nearly, uh, well, 18 years ago. Now this student of Southampton by the name of Richard Jones uh, uh, did a third year project, all right, did a third year project. He created an algorithm called Audio Scrobbler. Now what is this Audio Scrobbler? Audio Scrobbler, it's a bit like, um, for instance, a music player that you have. If you use a specific music player like Spotify, for instance, you tend to choose a the, the certain categories of song. So this audio scrobbler kind of like learn what kind of songs you want based on your selection. It's a bit like all the learning things we have now, but that already happened like 18 years ago. Uh, and uh, he managed to create that. 
and and it was actually uh, part of the this uh, last FM, which was a big big uh, music uh, um, online music uh, big player that actually worked closely with all the music player uh, providers such as Spotify, etc. So last FM actually create all these database for all the music players we have. And I can quote Spotify because I understand that in Malaysia, that's quite popular. Uh, and that's how Spotify get information about you, what kind of music you like and etc. Thanks to this audio scrubber. And the success story here is that he got a lot of share in it because his project was part of uh, this uh, real world project. And he got some stake in it. And apparently last FM was bought over by this uh, CBS cop for a huge amount. And his stake for that is around 38 million US dollars. And 38, me US, 38 million US dollars in today's standard will be maybe close to 50, 60 million US dollars. So that's the kind of quantum. Of course, uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying that we have success story like this every every time. It's not. But what I'd like to point out here is that the University of Southampton provides students that facility, that environment to make this a reality. So we are facilitating whatever we present. We give you the opportunities when you are reverse and you just make the most of it to achieve your aspiration. Okay, I will actually just uh, talk more about the, the program. Uh, we recruit uh, a very successful group of students. Uh, typically they have high scores over at A level and I find that to be very helpful. Uh, for the students because it creates this uh, healthy competition among them. So if you join this uh, driven, uh, intelligent group of students, you will be driven along the same way. If you are feeling down, you go to, you, you, you just come together with them and naturally they will drive you along. So that's, that's what we actually uh, have here. And of course, uh, as pointed out by the previous speakers, I'm sure, uh, we have very high uh, staff to student ratio and we give uh, a, a lot of pastoral care and support, especially for the first year students. So when they actually come in, uh, they'll be assigned a personal academic tutor uh, in a small group setting, typically three to five students for triple E, where students can talk about academic matters or any non-academic matters. So at least we make sure that you know, the student is uh, taken care of. And of course, uh, once they have finished the two years in Malaysia, uh, when they actually are transitioning to the UK, they will receive the same uh, equal pastoral support. And we also have this uh, buddy scheme where we have their seniors previously with USM to actually guide them through. Of course, the first batch uh, won't have the equivalent of US and body scheme, but they have a body scheme that's actually from uh, the uh, uh, UK campus itself, mainly consists of uh, Malaysian students there. Uh, one thing I would like to remind everyone, should you have question related to accreditation, is that uh, our MH degree is accredited to meet the academic requirement for our graduates to register as a chartered engineer and saying this is recognized by engineering boards around the world, including the ones that we have here in Malaysia, which is through the Board of Engineers Malaysia. Okay, now I would like to touch on uh, careers and employability. Um, our, uh, the UK campus, once in, students are in the third year and fourth year, they actually run this annual engineering and technology fair. So once a year, there are many, many companies come along and they actually provide uh, work placement opportunities, internship opportunities, and other opportunities for students to get on. So, so this, is, this is the facilitation uh, bit that I mentioned earlier on. So we actually provide tons of opportunities for our students because we know that students are shouting out for all these opportunities. And the rest now is actually up to the students to actually make the application and go on. 
And I am going to share with you uh, one uh, particular nice story that I have uh, that's to do with uh, BP uh, Petroleum Engineering. Now this USM student, uh, uh, he was from the third batch of the AAA program. So when he actually went to the UK in the third year, he went to this engineering and technology fair that particular year. And he bumped into this uh, BP, BP UK, of course, uh, that's uh, based over at the north of the country in Aberdeen. So he, he applied for the internship placement program. He, he got it. And, and uh, I won't call it luck because he has got the credentials to qualify him for the program. Of course, in everything, you need a bit of a luck element, but I'll attribute more on the, the technical content that he has. Uh, he, got the great, he got the internship placement program, and that's a very nice uh, package that they give. So he stayed on in the UK to do internship, and um, upon graduation, he successfully secured himself the graduate placement program. And for BP UK, the kind of package that they have for graduate placement program is around £35,000 to £40,000 per annum. And that's uh, not adding all the other bonuses, uh, performance bonuses that we have. So that's a fantastic story. And he actually came back and visited us. And that was uh, very nice uh, to see him. It was really gratifying for all us here to actually see the fine product that the system has produced. And of course, we have a lot of internship opportunities here for uh, Malaysian students as well. In fact, just two months ago, we have this uh, internship day uh, where we've got companies, local companies in Malaysia to come, their HR coming over to give talk, to tell the internship opportunities and students will then have the opportunity to apply and ask any question relating to all this. And of course, it's not just limited to that particular internship day. It, we regularly invite different companies to come and talk about the internship placement program they have. Uh, we work closely on that with Intel. Uh, for Intel, uh, we do have a long-standing relationship. And in 2016, I'll just, uh, 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 I'll just uh, talk about this. Uh, in 2016 alone, we happened to have six of our USM students to do internship over there. I mean, it is not by chance. <laughs> Right, that we have so many of our students doing internship and not as if that Intel Penang has got so many internship opportunities available. Uh, it goes to show uh, how our students make us proud. They actually represent us. That is why we need to, we, we emphasize so much on research, teaching and learning. All this core of a university. And we can see if we put them nicely in the package that we have now, you can actually create these great students. And they are they're ambassadors for us. When they work in Intel, the kind of skills that they have, it says it all. And that is why so many of them were able to get internships. And I'm just going to quote another nice example I have. Uh, way, uh, uh, this student of ours, uh, second batch, second batch, all right. Uh, now he's a hardcore Intel guy. He did, in the first year of his study, he got internship with Intel, second year Intel, third year, fourth year Intel as well. So what happens was that he actually flew back from UK to do internship here in Malaysia. And truly enough, upon graduation, he is now working as an engineer at Intel Penang. And he has done so well, such that Intel has given him uh, the opportunity to uh, pay for his, uh, pay the opportunity for him to do a PhD degree with us. So he's actually doing a part-time PhD with Southampton whilst working at Intel. So he regularly travels to Malaysia to uh, meet with the supervisors and to do research. Now, this is what I promised earlier on, I wanted to share with you. Uh, the picture of the uh, part of the first cohort uh, who, am, who have all graduated uh, that was back uh, in 2017, all right? Uh, that's our first batch of students and 
they are everywhere. Okay. Uh, and the last bit that I would like to share with you is the scholarship the opportunity that we have. Uh, we offer a wide range of scholarships from foundation to undergraduate and it's all listed here. It may not be exhaustive, but I will urge you to actually look at the list of scholarships we have and, uh, and, and you can apply for it. And for those of you who have, uh, would like to consider some other external scholarships, uh, other opportunities in terms of funding, uh, I would actually recommend you to actually look at uh, Yayasan Tenaga Nasional. Uh, Yayasan Kazana, Yayasan Telecom you, uh, used to actually send their, their sponsored students over, but because of their current economy uh, spending, I think they, they actually stopped that for the, for the time being. Uh, but I caught up with the, the scholarship director for the Yayasan Tenaga Nasional just uh, before Christmas last year. And uh, he said that Yayasan Tanaga National will continue to send scholars over to Southampton. All right, uh, that's uh, something for you to actually check it out. Uh, of course, I'm not giving you uh, an exhaustive list here. Please look out for all these opportunities because they are available. All right, for that, I am going to uh, end my uh, talk here. And now I would like to check if I have any question from the audience. So just open the chat, bear with me. Right, if I haven't got any audience from Zoom, uh, can the panelists uh, inform me if they have questions coming from Facebook Live? But I'm just going to go through uh, some of the commonly asked questions uh, that we have over the years uh, whilst waiting for those questions to actually come in. Actually, I do have one. Okay, I'll, I'll attend to this particular question first. Okay, how much does fresh grad earn? Now, actually, this is the one, this is one of the commonly asked questions uh, that, that I have actually prepared. What is the salary range for a graduate? Now, I can't, I can't actually uh, know for sure, but you see, I can quote from that very nice case that I have had, you know, from our past graduate who is now working with BP. Uh, he continued to stay on the UK, and one good news about that is that the UK has actually revised their, their, uh, their visa, uh, call it the employment visa or graduate visa, uh, which allows graduates to actually continue to stay on in the UK to look for a job upon you graduating. So once you have graduated in the UK, you can actually apply for this visa to stay for another two years in the country to look for a job. And as you can see from the read.com just now, uh, there's quite a lot of opportunities for triple E. And the salary range for that BP case, that's to the tune of 35 to 40. Of course, uh, that could be uh, a unique example. But I will also, this reminds me of uh, another example that we have, the same batch. They all came back and we asked them, where are you and things like that. And actually a couple of them actually joined this uh, company called JP Morgan and Barclays Bank. Bank, Barclays Bank is the equivalent of Maybank in Malaysia. And JP Morgan is an investment company. You would wonder why triple E engineer, what's a triple E engineer doing in a finance company and an investment company? Now that thanks to the uh, rise of the cyber security, you know, and, and the development of all these uh, pervasive systems. And that's why AAA is really sought after. Okay, all right. All right, I uh, will just uh, look at that. Now, I, uh, there's a question coming from the audience uh, talking about uh, biomedical engineering degree. Is it the same as biomedical science? Now. Nah. These are different, all right? Now, what's biomedical engineering? 
Now, biomedical engineering is really putting electronics in the application for biomedical science. I can give you one very nice example. For instance, people are looking for ways to actually perform this uh, non-invasive method to check on the sugar level in your blood. Instead of pricking your fingers to get that sample out, is there an alternative way where you can make it non-invasive at all? So developments underway to, to create this bio-impedance chip where uh, you can actually just swallow in and you will be able to measure a uh, certain reaction from the, from the insulin level in your body. So that's like using electronics to actually get information out. You can also relate that to sensor design because everything, when you think about it, all the things that we do in engineering, it's all about making your life more comfortable and better. That's why our slogan is really make the world better. We, how do we make it better? We need to sense things. So we create sensors technology and we need to talk to these sensors. This is where triple E engineers come in. You need to make sure that we can actually get the information over in the best way possible. And once we get the information, you need to present it to the end user. Of course, you save all the electronic circuits that happen in the background but you are able to showcase that. So that's the difference. As for biomedical science research, they're looking at the really bio aspects of things. How would those uh, molecular level things behave and things like that, the characterization and, and really the scientific side of it. It is uh, very different compared to the engineering uh, aspect. Okay, I've got another question. Why is there no April intake for degree course? Uh, because we only have one intake for degree and that is to align with the UK campus. We start in October in semester one and semester two continue on around the Chinese New Year period in Malaysia up to uh, June period. So you have really October to June to actually do your two semesters. And uh, I, I quite like this setting because you have July, August, September to actually do internship. You have a full three month period where you have no contact hours because that's your summer break. I know there is no summer break in Malaysia. It's summer all year round, but it's the equivalent of that long period where you can actually use the time to get into the internship. Okay. So let's see if I have more questions. All right. I think uh, that's the question I have. Uh, but uh, I, will, I will address uh, some of these uh, things I have here that I've prepared earlier on so I can talk it through. Like for instance, uh, what kind of jobs will I, will I be able to apply for? Now this is really uh, a quite a common question. When I go to fair and things like that, they would actually ask this. Now, now you have to understand that we humans are, I mean, the world is evolving always. Uh, Five years ago, or maybe shorter than that, three years ago, uh, we rarely hear job nature of uh, data science, data analytics like that. Uh, maybe, maybe it's around, but not as popular as of now. Cybersecurity, yes, it's there, but it's not really a profession, is it? But now it seems like it is. So the landscape is evolving. So the critical thing for you to actually accommodate all these new challenges is that your fundamental skill set must be there. Just like what I have uh, mentioned earlier on, you've got the fundamentals and that would allow you to choose the range of project that we offer. Does it mean that this skill set, you can only do this uh, uh, power engineering and you can't do cybersecurity? No, you can choose. The fact that from this kind of high level, look at the program, you will see that you can take it on. Now, we are not teaching you just to drive a Honda and I give you a BMW and you won't know how to drive. No, we are telling you how to drive a car regardless of the brand, All right? So, so that's, that's the kind of a message that I would like to share with everyone. Okay, I will now check again if uh, any question. And Chishen, uh, uh, who is uh, our, our one of our academic, if you would like to share anything, just feel free. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, sure. So my, uh, maybe I need to share a lot of things on electronics. Yeah? So I just want to give 
people some ideas on the power side. Yeah. So just now I mentioned something on, so Triple E has the electronic sites and we have the electrical side as well. And just now I give some examples on the um, classical power system. That is the, the main technology that's supporting our today's modern world. However, there's also this aspect of what we call the modern power engineering, which is basically about infusing the intelligence that we see nowadays into power engineering. Why is it so important? So you think about that. Okay, I'll give you one example is nowadays we almost renewable energy. So our government has an ambitious target of um, increasing the renewable energy penetration to 20% yeah? uh, in, uh, in, um, in Malaysia yeah? in, by, in within five years from now. Yeah? So we may think that, all right, that is just a number. We can increase that to 20%. Twenty percent. Uh, if you really look, if the research, when researcher really look into the, the the feasibility aspect, in fact, there are a lot of challenges to overcome here. Yeah. For one, is that we have the solar energy that comes into the system at different time, yeah, and they may just be gone in a snap of fingers. So then, how can we make sure that we have energy all the time? Yeah. So this is actually one challenges that is being faced by a lot of like, utility worldwide. And in order to solve this one, there are a lot of algorithms that people look at other things to predict the nature of the solar, to predict when it will come. And there are a lot of battery research technology that is being invented nowadays. And we have battery in our phone, but now we are talking about the battery for the power grid. And the size of that is probably a few trucks, uh, maybe tens of truck size, yeah. So that kind of technology is being researched and in university level. Okay. And then we will most likely see that in 10 years, 20 years down the road yeah, in our society. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for your insight, uh, Chin Sen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think uh, we'll uh, wrap it up now. And Thank you. Uh, we hope to see you in the coming semester.